I get to talk to you again. I'm excited. Daniel and Fantastic. I always have have uh, really interesting conversations on DevOps Radio, really insightful. So thank you for joining us. Um, next, we have Jennifer Hansen, Director of Product Management Delivery Experience at Capital One. Jennifer? Hi, Brian. Um, hello, everyone. I am excited to be over here today talking about this panel topic. I'm the product lead for creating a unified, cohesive delivery experience at Capital One. So this is very near and dear to my heart. Awesome. Thank you for joining us and thank you for that intro. And then we now have somebody from my local hometown area, uh, Redwood City. We have Adam Robertson, head of DevOps at Pinger. Hello, Adam. Hey, good morning, Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Adam. I'm the head of DevOps at Pinger uh, here in Silicon Valley, and uh, excited to see you guys again. Thank you for joining. Love the surfboards in the back. And you guys are already uh, familiar with Bob Kelly, who just delivered our customer keynote. He, again, is the director of delivery engineering at IHG. So we're going to go ahead and um, jump in and discuss um some key topics in relation to, to, to speed versus quality and compliance and DevOps in the enterprise. So first we wanna uh, cover the topic of defining DevOps in the enterprise, right? What does DevOps mean in the enterprise versus small to medium business or versus that happy path that we always hear about at conferences, right? Here goes your mainline trunk development, get everybody on tool, what what have you. What are the unique challenges and benefits? So um, Jennifer, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Um, you know, I realize that, that Capital One operates at a massive scale. And in fact, Capital One is outpacing some competitors that are two to three times as large. So it seems like you've you know, got a hold on how to modernize your software to development and delivery. Uh, can you share with me or share with us um, how you define enterprise DevOps? Sure. So you called out pretty accurately, we are a digital leader in the financial services industry today and on a mission to change banking for good. But at the heart of it, we are aiming to empower our engineers to build great products for our customers. So for me and for all of us at Capital One, DevOps at its heart is about people and culture. So we have been building a culture of continued learning and development. We've been reimagining our operating model. We wanna have our designers, engineers, product managers, business partners, they all work together. We are trying to continue to create the shared experience across the board, shared responsibility, shared accountability, because ultimately we are all in this together, trying to create a better customer experience. Now our agile and DevOps transformation has been a significant multi-year journey. We have been focused on delivering high quality working software in a consistent, safe, reliable, and efficient manner. So that's a lot. <laughs> right. and, Easy. And, you know, yeah. So to really get to this, we've transformed how we work across the software delivery life cycle. I was listening to Bob and all the challenges and the great accomplishments that he has been driving internally with IHG. And in a very similar manner, we shifted. We shifted from waterfall to agile and DevOps. We started to align on RESTful APIs. We moved to a microservices architecture, containerization in the cloud. We've been actively contributing to and using open source software. And then we have a cloud first mindset. So yes, ultimately our goal is about speed and automation while remaining secured and applying all those good best practices of what it means to be well managed on the cloud. I think like a few key takeaways as I reflect on the journey 
it starts with having the right cultural and mindset shifts, right? Add your practices at scale, you build your own shared accountability models with our engineers and across the company. It's about maturing our engineering practices and understanding that we are on this journey. It's not gonna happen overnight, but we need to continue to mature and elevate. We need to promote reuse and we've been encouraging innovation across the board, open source first. Inner sourcing, Bob called out his contribution model. We are big on that. We have a lot of hackathons. Simplification, automation, and yes, we do have some standardization across our delivery uh, platform. We need to get to common patterns, core tool sets, and think about automation of our control gates. So these have been some of the things that we have been working on actively for the last seven plus years. It is definitely a journey. We're not done, but I'm excited to be part of this journey at Capital One. Awesome. Thank you, Jennifer, for the detailed response and those insights. So what I heard is it's super easy and you guys will be done tomorrow, right? Uh, Okay. Um, So, you know, appreciate that. One of the things you brought up there is, um, shared ownership and empowerment. And I look forward to having you chime in when we dig on, on that topic uh, a bit later. Now, of the organizations on the call, um, Adam has a different perspective, right? He's dealing with a um, slightly younger, um, smaller, more digital native organization. Adam, at Pinger, how is your experience different from what Jennifer shared and what some of the other panelists may experience? Uh, yeah, as you had expected, it's a lot to do with scale. Um, you know, we have less than 100 committers and, you know, six to eight engineering teams, uh, all local, and we have, you know, Romanian counterparts. But uh, for the most part, it's a smaller team. You can establish a little closer relationships with the engineers. Um, most of what um, Jennifer had mentioned is actually, it, it, it holds true. It's just at a different scale, right? Uh, some of these things, you they transcend uh, from enterprise to smaller companies. And... Uh, you want to keep that in mind because when you're building some of the foundational elements, you want to have in mind the greater picture, which is you want to get to enterprise scale and you want to be able to build the systems to scale up in that way. And a lot of the times um, you're not building for you know 10,000 engineers, but at the same token, you, you want to build like you're supporting 10,000 engineers so you can support that scale as you grow as a company. Thank you. Thank you. Um, So what we're going to go ahead and do um, is we're going to shift from enterprise DevOps to something that's, you know, uh, uh, not necessarily unique to enterprises, uh, but critical. And that is getting the balance between security, compliance, and quality with speed. So we're going to move um, to Daniel to start out on this one. Um, Daniel, Jennifer, and Adam had uh, different perspectives and points of view on enterprise DevOps. Now, I think you'd agree that that this balance we're talking about is a key part of it. Can you share with me how you guys have approached uh, balancing security, compliance, and quality with speed at Broadwidge, especially at the size of your company? Absolutely. You know, when, when you're a financial services industry and you're dealing with other people's money, uh, you have to make sure that you're not making mistakes uh, by leaving doors open or opportunities for bad guys to come in and cause trouble. So uh, we've definitely had to err on the side of caution, uh, but there are many opportunities to um, build in things which will help speed up the pipeline. And so the idea is security can be a built-in aspect of what you're doing. You can have that be automated or at least have those checkpoints be automated so that um, we can have a high level of confidence about what we're doing. Awesome. Awesome. Um, um, yeah. I always, I always like to say that in a number of cases, speed can increase security, right? Mm-hmm. Um, at minimum, having the ability to respond and react fast versus having a slow, um, 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 hard, uh, you know, high, high mean lead time uh, product cycle. So thank you for that. Um, Adam, we're going to circle back to you real quick. Um, How do you balance these elements? You called out that you do have some of these same problems, not at the same scale. 
Um, how do you balance them? And do you err towards one versus the other speed versus security or com I guess you won't say you do, right? um, but how do you balance it? Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, you know, as a smaller company and we're not in the finance or health industry, so we're not subject to like HIPAA or any other kind of compliance. Um, we still have to, you know, honor compliance for things like GDPR and CCPA because we do have customer data, but it's less important when you're at, um, you know, not not a financial company or a health company, but they're still important. You still um, want to do right by your customer and um, honor their privacy and, and security is important no matter what company you're in and what scale. So these are important things. I think one way you can, uh, one way that I found of balancing it is making sure that, you know, they all have a seat at the table and that you build a system that can be agile enough to where you can add these elements as you need them if you need to emphasize them. So as we grow, for instance, if you didn't have to deal with uh, GDPR and all of a sudden you do, you go international with a product, you need a system that is able to, like it's modular, you can plug in these individual security components or extra steps um, along the way, along your pipeline in a very seamless and um, uh, painless, pain, as painless as possible manner. Right. Um, if you can kind of see these things coming and you, you build your system to expand, you have plugins, you've got modules you can plug in onto these systems, you can scale a whole lot easier. And then it's just another day, another yeah. thing. It's not a large, scary thing that you're not used to doing. It's just the team has practice with it and you're, you know how to scale. Uh, and, and what I love and what I take from that was kind of uh, one is a progressive rollout Two is future proofing, right? Build out an architecture where, you know, you can add them in as you need. Another thing that you brought up, um, circle back to something Bob said uh, with his, uh, how they implemented secur security and governance standards with a committee using a voice of the customer approach. Um, so maybe Bob uh, will we'll bring you back in for a moment. Do you have uh, any comment to add about the need to, involve stakeholders when defining security gates and compliance gates? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, we're lucky enough to have a, um, a very capable security team that provides us with certain guidelines. Um, what we're trying to do to help teams out is to uh, look for ways to uh, provide um, a shift left model to the security testing piece, um, moving some of that as we can into the CI flow uh, so that teams or developers get feedback on certain aspects of their code um, as they're actually developing it and as they attempt to merge it into the branch they're working in. Um, so uh, we work with them there um, and in the delivery flow doing similar things to help identify for them, you know, what they can be working on. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you. So um, to give us some time for questions and answers, um, Jennifer, I'm going to help you segue us into the next topic, which is something that you touched upon earlier. And that is this concept of shared ownership and empowering the practitioner, right? There's a lot of talk. I'm hearing it more and more um, from this panel here, from your, from your peers, something I really believe in, and that's having um, happy and empowered practitioners and developers means you have productive and innovative practitioners and developers. Um, and, you know, what I'd like to learn from the panel, right, is, is do you believe in that? How does that tie into culture? And how is that necessary to enable scale? Um, so, Jennifer, to direct a question specifically um, to you, how have you balanced standardization with autonomy and empowerment of your developers, and I like to say your practitioners across the spectrum? Right. Um, so as I think about that question, Brian, we are in the financial services industry. We want it all in terms of we want to empower our customers and our engineers, but we need to delight our auditors, right? right. That is a <laughs> critical component of this. We've done a lot of empathy interviews, design thinking sessions, usability studies, focus groups to really get to the heart of what our engineers want. 
And we've got this tagline. It's hashtag make ship happen. That's what our engineers want. They want their code to get out of the door really quickly. And we want it to be well managed. So as we thought about this and we said, well, how can we empower our engineers and improve the experience? So plenty of journey maps later, we realized process simplification and automation, reuse of highlighted, the whole you build, you own is that accountability model. But what we came up with is we set up a software engineering clean room. So we borrowed from manufacturing, if you like. Mm. And within this clean room, our product teams are now able to continuously deploy high quality software, right? What we figured out is what are those core principles that Bob was mentioning? And what do we want to hold our teams true to? How do we certify the delivery pipelines? Now I have to give a shout out to Dr. Topo Pal. He's oh, a yeah. distinguished fellow and a peer of mine at Capital One. And he's been instrumental in helping us set up the clean room. And it's not a once and done thing. It is about maturity. It's about ensuring that we can get to those high quality compliance secure releases. I'm happy to say that we are here in this journey and we have hundreds of teams that are releasing today via the clean room. So it's, it's insightful because it's not just about we track incidents, we've seen reduction in our incident trends, we've been tracking the number of releases, but I think the value it brings is you get real-time delivery insights and metrics, right? right? And that's what you need. You need to understand where the gaps are, where the problems are, and how to mature the practices. So sometimes you think you want something and you have to trade off. But what we've tried to do is approach it with, we want to promote open source. We want to be that kind of a culture. And at the same time, we need to react quickly to any open source vulnerabilities. So there isn't a trade-off, it's this and that. We want that faster commit to prod deploy, but we don't wanna have, uh, we wanna ensure every commit is reviewed. I heard some great conversations about the types of development, the PR checks. We want our commits tested and verified and we want that lower incident rate. So the clean room has really become that capability and that notion of helping us get here. Right, right. Well, I'd love the idea so much to dig in. Um, uh, first, delight auditors. That's the first time I've heard that. We want to ha we, we want to satisfy empowered developers and delight auditors. And you're bringing them along on the road. Um, well, on the journey. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, and the other thing I'd like to call out that I love from other conversations I've had with you that, that kind of showed up here, and it's a product management approach to figuring out how to build out this service, right? You spoke about journey maps and design thinking. For those here that aren't familiar with the design thinking approach to doing this um, that lives in, in, in modern product uh, management, um, give it a look. Now, Daniel, I happen to know, and I'm gonna tell on us again, cause I always do. I happen to learn over uh, a bottle of maybe too much red wine <laughs> that you are passionate about this topic. You've shared the analogy of letting developers run with scissors if they want to, so how does that relate to this concept of shared ownership at Broadwich? You know, I, I might say running with blunted scissors. Um, oh, you know, there, there's, there, there's something, um, I don't know, re really important about this topic because it, it, it touches on some of the joys of human existence, really, right? I mean, the people that are involved in all of these different processes have chose their career, right? We, we are autonomous beings and... We got excited about learning about these things and practicing these things because we got something out of it. And as an enterprise, you have to have standards. You have to have frameworks that give people an understanding of what you're trying to accomplish as an organization. You have to have security guardrails and, and guidelines in place. You have to have all of these different aspects come together. But if you take, if you take the, the experience away from the individual that is driving them to be creative and productive, 
you're going to, you know, um, really soften the ability of that individual to be productive in a meaningful way. So right. the key is to find that, find that sweet spot between maintaining that structure that a large organization requires, but also giving as much freedom and autonomy as is possible to the individual so that they can exercise their creative license to do something that's really going to benefit the organization. Agree. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Did you have a comment, Bob? I was just agreeing. <laughs> Emph emphatically. Yeah. Um, well, so let's go ahead and actually shift to you for a moment, um, Bob, as we unfortunately start to move towards the end of our panel here. Um, you know, you're engaging disparate teams and you're bringing them together. Um, and you did talk a bit about how you encouraged collaboration and adoption by at the same time letting them choose tools. Can I ask if you were to share, you know, one key principle in balancing sort of empowerment, you know, adoption and, uh, and collaboration, what would that be? One key principle. Yep, I'm putting you on the spot. We didn't plan for this one. Um, at the in the collaboration piece, uh, I'm probably going to focus more on the DevOps team's collaboration with a development team, and kind of take the rest of the organization out for a moment. And that's um, where we've adjusted our thinking. Um, similar to the way Jennifer's described the way they work at Capital One in, in terms of um, bringing to the table um, a, a high level abstraction of the goal that we're trying to hit and then partnering with the teams and the developers to achieve that goal in a way that satisfies the corporate need and, and their need and ability to contribute. It's driven in part by um, our opening up our code base to their contribution. Um, and it's opened up in terms of the way that we really want them to be involved in, in the pipeline construction and to tell us what they need rather than mm -hmm. for us to describe or define what they should be doing. Um, and so we, we do have a series of quality gates that are not exactly the same, but semi-standardized across the board, but we don't walk in with a lockdown set of rules in the way that you're going to achieve that goal or when. We work that out with each team and we let the team be very largely responsible for their mm -hmm. success because they have been responsible for that success in the past. And we've, uh, our company has grown based on that effort. And so we need to recognize it. So you allow them to run with blunted scissors as well, as but then you offer, <laughs> but, then, but then you offer to help patch them up better, build, bit bigger, better, stronger. Um, well, thanks for that answer. Um, shifting to Adam, I'm really curious, right? We've, we've, um, uh, we've gotten answers from actually organizations that are orders of magnitude um, larger. Right. Uh, so I have to assume that because you've been able to take more of a greenfield approach, right, in building these these practices and teams, that it, it's got to be really easy, right? All of your practitioners are empowered and happy, no problem, right? That is not the case. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's got its own set of challenges as well, um, because a lot of you know when you have smaller teams, you have a lot of people that have been a part of building the existing systems that are already there. Mm. And yeah. they have a lot of pride of ownership and um, a lot of comfort level, like a high level of comfort with these systems as well. So when you're walking in as you know someone who's an agent of change making suggestions, it's a very careful, careful um, approach. You can't you know go in just saying you're going to change everything that they've built because they've you know there's some pride with what they've done and there's some like I said level of comfort. So you know, you have to spend a lot of time listening to, you know, why things were uh, built the way they are and why they're operating and why they're comfortable there. Cause there's reasons for it. And like, you know, I think someone mentioned earlier, there's a lot of smart people that design systems that have worked to them for a long time. Um, and so your job is kind of to understand um, what, 
the ecosystem is that you're getting into and like start to make change and like actually get everyone on board um, with that. I think an analogy uh, that I've heard that I really like is, you know, the, the team that wins the Iditarod is the one with the Huskies, you know, take you across the finish line. You're not dragging your dogs, right? Yeah. So, you know, you want your team to be excited uh, about what you're doing and they can see the benefits and the approach of doing that um, can be harder in smaller companies because a lot of times people that you're trying to convince to change are the ones that built those systems in the first place. Yeah. And so, um, and, and generally what I found is it takes, it takes time. It takes longer than you think. And you have to build some trust. And, uh, you know, Daniel pointed out that, you know, these are people who take a lot of, they, they did this for a reason, right? They didn't right. just do it because they were told to, right? They're, they have a vested interest in the systems that they built and, you know, for you to go in and ask them to, to make sometimes really hard uh, changes. Um, you know, like I think Bob's uh, Bob's slide of saying, "Who wants change?" Yes, like who? Okay, right. let's do it. Oh, wait, wait. This, right. is hard. this is hard, um, and that's very much the case. Um, no matter what, I think at any scale, I think that's just the way it is. So you show the benefits, you show how this will work, you show how building these, uh, and empowering them, and building these self service tools, it can really benefit them, and they start to see this, and it you see the benefits all around. It's a win for management, it's a win for the engineering team, it's a win for you. Um, to basically let them run with blunted and eventually extra extraordinarily sharp <laughs> running, right? Um, but it's a slow process, and you just have to be really mindful of the, you know the personalities and um, just the fact that you're asking people to make a large change to their day to day, and that day to day is something that they've been used to and that they had a vested part in building, and it's a careful thing, um, no matter what scale, I think. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I think there's important points there. First, I, I do have to joke that, that Bob had a slide where resilience um, was sort of in the center of the slide. And I think, um, you know, for your shared services and DevOps teams, there has to be a certain amount of resilience. And for the people, you know, the development teams, there has to be a certain amount of resilience because it's hard for all of us to change. It's not easy. And what I love about a common theme across all of your responses that I want to highlight is, you know, at the end of the day, we talk DevOps, CI, CD, all of these practices, but it's people that deliver software, right? And, and you can't unlock um, really any of the potential of what we're talking about until you tend to and address people, right? So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you bringing um, that up. Um, so now what we're going to do is we have a minute to bring in uh, one question. We'll see if maybe we can get two answers to it based on time. And uh, this question was actually um, asked multiple times. And I mean, by multiple people. And that's, you know, to, to paraphrase it, how did you gain management or C-level support for your DevOps initiatives? And uh, Jennifer, I'd like to start with you to see if you have some thoughts on this. So this is actually an easy one for me to answer because um, our commitment and journey has been bottom up and top down. So we have had exactly. tremendous support for the agile DevOps transformation. And you know, how you work is a key thing. You have to really understand that. And then working back with the teams, understanding the challenges, figuring out how to operate at scale is what makes you successful. So we can't say we would have got here without that commitment right down, uh, from our CEO and the rest of the leadership and teams enjoying how agile is, right? The whole waterfall and handoffs wasn't quite working as effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I would love to dig in and apologies to the rest of the panelists. We didn't, they sent me a remote taser and they're tasing me, letting me know I'm at time <laughs> now. Um, so I just, I want to take a moment to, to, to thank you guys so much. Um, not only for the time you put together in preparing for this panel, the time you spent on the panel, but the experience that you've acquired um, doing this in your current roles and, uh, and the fact that you're sharing it with a larger group. I do have to say, by the way, before I let you go, I do have to say you all look phenomenal. 
perfect framing, <laughs> perfect pictures. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank Jude for that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for your time. And if you get a chance, panelists, there's been a lot of questions for you. Please take a look at Zoom. Maybe we can get you guys over in Slack or chat um, to participate with our, with our participants. And uh, I look forward to our next conversation. Thank you, Thanks, Brian. Brian. Thank, Thank you, you Brian. Thank you.